those of you who missed the notes today or went ahead and weren't paying as much attention as they could have. So the new unit here is called Industrialization, Immigration, Urbanization, and Reform. And these are the topics we're going to be talking about. Industrialization, which is the factory lifestyle and people living in factories. You have the immigration, which is people moving to America. That urbanization, living in cities, and the reform of things that are not going well in the world during this time. So first topic is immigration. So we're going to be concentrating on these early 1900s, but you want to look at the history a little bit. So immigration, old immigration, those first early 13 colonies, that was mostly from England. But as you get to the 1840s and 1850s, you see about 1.5 million immigrants coming to America from Ireland because of a potato famine, uh, destruction of the potatoes. They came mostly to New York and Boston. But by the 1920s, mo many, most of the immigrants were coming actually from Southern and Eastern Europe and from Italy or Poland or Hungary, and many of them were Jews. And we're going to talk a lot about Judaism when we talk about World War II. But those people coming to the United States now will help them a little bit later, right? When they're not in Europe, when Hitler takes over. So this is some um, charts here for you to see kind of what's going on. You've got these northern and western Europeans coming early, and then it sort of shifts over to more southern and eastern European people coming in later. And then it kind of balances out by the time we get to World War II. So as people entered America, they came in mostly through New York Harbor, and they passed the Statue of Liberty. They are, the hope is they're coming to a new land, a new land that can give them the jobs and the money that they need to survive. So many people brought their entire families, and when they came to New York Harbor, they passed the New York landmark of the Statue of Liberty. There's a great poem on the Statue of Liberty that says, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the tempest, the homeless, the tempest toss to me. I lift my light beside the golden door. So when they entered New York Harbor, they went straight to Ellis Island. It's the first stop where people entered coming into America. And they go there kind of like a border check for check for disease and criminal record. And once they left Ellis Island, they went into the cities and formed their own neighborhoods. And many of those neighborhoods were ethnic neighborhoods where most people spoke the same languages, uh, carried on some of the same traditions. So this one happens to be in Little Italy. This is a colorized picture from 1901. But New York, Boston, Chicago all had these immigrant neighborhoods or ethnic neighborhoods. And this, some of them, like Chinatown, still exist today, and even Little Italy. A lot of people moved into these things called tenement dwellings, these big apartment buildings. Today we would call them slums, uh, the worst parts of the town cheaply built apartment buildings, overcrowded. They usually didn't have running water or um, bathrooms. And of course, they had wood stoves and yellow fires and all sorts of problems like that. Really not the best place. A lot of people wash their clothes out and, you know, hanging them out, that kind of stuff. Lots of people noticed that there were issues with these um, places. And one of the reformers was a guy named Jacob Reese, and he wrote a book called How the Other Half Lives. And he was a journalist. And he went into some of these slums and took pictures about what life was like for some of these immigrants living to like kind of wake up the public. Another issue that needed reform was child labor. A lot of immigrant children were put to work in sweatshops or businesses with harsh working conditions. And people wanted, businesses wanted children to work for them because they could pay them very little money. Uh, so you get no school and a lot of uh, children working in these really harsh conditions. Along with all this comes industrial accidents like this factory fire. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire was in 1911, and it was the largest industrial disaster in the history of New York City. Uh, these women were stuck, were caught in this fire when uh, the building caught on fire, and when all this clothing was in there. It's a trial. It's a shirtwaist factory, so a skirt factory. So they made, they sewed skirts, and they couldn't get out because they were locked in because they were owners were afraid they were stealing fabric. So women had to jump from the 7th and 8th floor, and, and many of them died, and you see the picture there. So into this also comes uh, this idea of nativism, and we're not talking about Native Americans here or American Indians. We're talking about Native-born Americans who felt that the immigrants, the flood of immigrants, was taking away their jobs. So they um, 
they form this extreme dislike for foreigners. It's called nativism. And workers blamed immigrants for low wages or shortages of employment. And there was a lot of resentment. Uh, they even made flags like this one, Native Americans beware of foreign influence. And again, they don't mean American Indians. Uh, they mean native born Americans. And they made immigrants their scapegoats. And scapegoat means that they were the ones that were blamed for all the problems. Asian people were one of the people that really, groups of people that really got blamed for a lot of problems. And you know, when you come here from Germany, as long as you don't open your mouth and they don't hear your German accent, you can't be identified. But it's hard to hide your Chinese-ness or your Asian-ness. So during the late 1800s, a lot of Asian immigrants come into uh, the West Coast. And many people left China because it was overcrowded or there was high unemployment or there was poverty or there was famine, people were starving. Uh, there were so many Chinese immigrants coming in that they actually passed this thing called the Chinese Exclusion Act that reduced the amount of Asian immigrants coming in by the late 1800s and actually barred immigration from China for 10 years. And anyone who was already here was barred from becoming a U.S. citizen. So in summary for immigration, beginning of the 1800s, most immigrants are coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. Beginning in the late 1800s, sorry. Immigrants living in their own separate neighborhoods uh, kept a lot of their former traditions. You get a massive increase in slums and tenement buildings in U.S. cities because of immigration. A lot of workers were blamed. Workers blamed immigrants for low wages and shortages of employment. You get this rise of nativism. Uh, and so that's the summary for the first section. So the second section talks about urban life, what it's like to live in these cities in the 1800s. So there are problems with living in cities. One of them, or some of them, are crime, violence, disease, and air pollution. Remember, wood fires and no indoor plumbing lead to grossness. So native-born Americans often blame these immigrants for all this crime because they were the ones coming in to these cities. So you can see from this graph, there are a lot of people living in cities all the way through. The number of people living in cities goes up as the number of people living in the countryside goes down. So the government and the people start seeing all these poor people living in cities and saying, we need to do something about this. So the government steps in and starts to kind of take a more active role in, in pulling things together and making things better in cities. And you get the foundation of these things called settlement houses. Our settlement houses were places where poor people could go for medical care and child care and libraries and classes in English for immigrants. The most famous one is this one here called Hull House, and it was formed in Chicago by a woman named Jane Addams. And Jane Addams was the founder of the settlement movement, and she actually was the first woman, or one of the first women, to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, she founded it in 1889. Another woman really important to this cause is a woman named Lillian Wald. She was a nurse, a social worker, and a public health official, and a teacher, and a writer, and a women's rights activist. And she founded the, uh, the American Community Nursing Program, also helping immigrants coming into cities. So a lot of these things are these idea of urban reforms, how to make life better. So another two groups that you may have heard of, the Salvation Army, they're the ones that ring the bells every Christmas. They were founded in 1878, and the YMCA, also founded in the late 1800s to help citizenship training and group activities, to, again, to help these immigrants coming into America. So when we think of cities, we don't just think of these tenement buildings and these slums, we think of skyscrapers. And back then, buildings were about five feet tall, because that's about as high as you could go with the technology. But as cities grew, they started to go up. The technology started to increase so that you could build your houses up. So at house, businesses, you want to go up. So you start seeing these big buildings start appearing. This one is the Flatiron Building in New York City, also the Empire State Building. And the building of these were incredible. You have these men who are up on these rafters, up super, super high, and sleeping and working up here on the top of the world without any nets, as you can see, or without any uh, wires to hold them. And when you get these big buildings, you also start thinking about, oh my gosh, we have to uh, develop systems to communicate. So that Alexander Bell uh, develops the first telephone in 1876. Uh, if you're going to be working all the time and you're only relying on the sun as your light, you got to come up with a new way to light your buildings. And Edison uh, develops the light bulb in 1879, along with lots of other inventions. 
you start getting some inventions in technology like the Bessemer process that, that is an invention that makes steel cheaper to, to produce and harder so you can build buildings higher and stronger. It was found, the American Steel was founded by Andrew Carnegie in Pittsburgh and that's why the Pittsburgh Steelers logo looks a lot like the American Steel logo. Other inventions during this time include the Wright brothers uh, being the first to create an airplane, You've got the rise of mass transit with trolley cars and subways in Chicago, New York, and San Francisco to help improve uh, transportation and move people, large amounts of people, around very quickly in cities. And you also have the development of time zones during this time period. Um, time zones like were so that people would know what time it was wherever in the country because before they were just taking sun, sun temp the sun height as their time. And if you all of a sudden can call from one side of the country to the other, you want to be able to know what time it is. So in summary, with great increase in urban problems, there's an increase in urban or in urban populations, there's an increase in crime and other problems like disease and air pollution and violence. Uh, limited amount of land and space means people went up in skyscrapers. Settlement houses helped the poor in numerous con uh, communities and helped the immigrants coming into the country. And you have new inventions like the light bulb, the telegraph, the telephone, the trolley car. Railroads, all that sort of stuff helped increase productivity and capacity in the cities for communication and transportation. So the last section here is about the birth of unions. I am the union president here at, uh, for the school, for the teachers, so I know a lot about unions. And they started back in the Industrial Revolution at the, by the 1900s when the United States starts to be a leading industrial world, like lots of factories. And when you have lots of factories, you have lots of workers. And it's all run by this thing called the free enterprise system, where people can go and own a business. And uh, that business is free to, to run without any way they want it to be run, without government interference. So if I own a business, I can say, oh, this is how long it's going to be open. This is what I'm going to make. Um, this is how many workers I need. So the free enterprise system meant businesses made their own rules. And without government interference, that meant that they could do whatever they wanted as long as no one called them on it. And in the 1800s, or late 1800s, early 1900s, that meant they were working with labor or people who worked for them that were really low wage, really low skilled, and that meant they could be easily replaced. So unions were formed to bring all, to, to unionize, to bring all the workers together to fight against the owner for more pay or better working conditions. And when you form a union, it means that the owners do not like you. So you get to be kind of this thing called blacklisted. And many of them couldn't get a job. Workers, businesses locked out their workers. They were Some of them were forced to sign contracts saying they wouldn't join a union. So unions were looked at pretty badly at the beginning. And then there was Karl Marx. And Karl Marx was a German philosopher. He was the guy who starts communism. He writes a book called The Communist Manifesto. And he argued that this whole idea of business owners and workers was just a bad idea and it was going to lead to the destruction of the world. And uh, he thought that eventually all the workers would revolt against the factories and overthrow the governments. So, of course, Marx is from Eastern Europe and all these Eastern European immigrants are coming into America. So people were really concerned that they were going to bring all these ideas with them. But still, people fought for the rights of workers, including with this woman named Mother Jones, and she was one of the first women uh, union leaders in the country, and she organized the United Mine Workers Union, gave some fiery speeches, worked for better pay. Uh, there was some really incredible strikes, like the 1877 railroad strike. A strike is when you stop working to, to protest. So they became violent a lot of times, and state militias were called out to stop the violence. Another group called the Knights of Labor uh, was founded, uh, and it helped call for an eight-hour workday and supported arbitration or this idea that we need to sit down and organize to end strikes. There was some obviously lots and lots of riots. In 1886, there was another riot in Chicago called the Haymarket Riot, and it led to some people dying. And actually, some people were convicted and even executed for their role in this riot. And the riot actually led to more people thinking unions were bad, being un-American. Uh, obviously, there are still unions today, so this doesn't last forever. Uh, another great union leader was this guy named Eugene Debs. He was the leader of the American Railway Union. He actually runs for president like four times. American Federation of Labor was founded by Samuel Gompers. He believed that 
union should stay out of politics and rather they should negotiate rather than go on strike. Another great strike was the Pullman strike and it was a nationwide strike, again against railroads, shut down the nation's railroad system, threatened the economy, and that made people actually realize maybe unions had some power. The IWW is the Wobblies, which is a great name, but they're the international workers of the world. They actually have a really bad reputation. They actually called for classes to unite and revolt against the world. They're, they're kind of a crazy group. They don't exist anymore. Women's Trade Union League also, uh, there's women who are involved, obviously, in the trade union because women are working during this time. And they were paid a lot less than men, so they were fighting for equal pay. It's the first union organized to address specifically women's labor union issues. So you got a lot of cartoons in the paper about, you know, people squeezing the money out of people, the low wage versus the high wage people. So in the end, for the unions, the free enterprise system is based on this idea of laissez-faire, and we talk about, about that in economics with Mr. Soderstrom. And that means that the government should not interfere with regulating business. Industrialization contributed to the development of low of labor unions because it created low wages, low skilled jobs, and made employees easier to replace. We had some strikes like the railroad uh, strike, great railroad strike, and the Knights of Labor is being becoming a very powerful union at the time. And Samuel Gompers becomes famous because he forms the American Federation of Labor, the largest trade union in the nation. So that is the notes on this. So you can take this information to help you fill out your doodle 